Hey everybody, welcome to What the Vuln. This is our inaugural episode. Um, I'm Dan Petro. This uh, series, we dive into vulnerabilities one bug at a time and uh, show some exploits about how to put them all together. So uh, with me today is uh, Carlos Janez. Uh, Carlos, how are you doing? Hey, Dan. Uh, I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Great. Yeah. So let's uh, dive right into it. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, Zimbra and uh, some vulnerabilities in Zimbra. So uh, what is Zimbra and uh, how do the vol uh, vulns work here? Uh, well, uh, Zimbra is a collaborative, collaborative software suite that includes a demo server and a web client. Uh, last year, two vulnerabilities were discovered in the Zimbra collaboration suite that pull out an attacker to execute code on a remote system. Uh, the first vulnerability is a SIPA traversal flow, which could allow an attacker to access sensitive information and execute remote code. The thing about the second vulnerability is that an authentication bypass on the previous one effectively allow, allow a, any user to execute um, this remote code. Cool. Yeah. So uh, talk to me about a zip path traversal vulnerability. How does that work exactly? How can you uh, use that to take over a server? OK, uh, well, zip path traversal refers to a type of vulnerability that allows an attacker to access files and folders outside the intended target directory. In the case of the Simbra collaboration suit, the vulnerability allows an attacker to extort a file to a public directory. And this file can contain a payload to execute on the target. Cool. Uh, why don't we uh, jump into a demo and uh, see about how we uh, developed an exploit for this, huh? Right. So the first thing to do is to install the network edition of the Simbra collaboration suit. Now with access to the code, we can begin to plan our exploit, which is divided into three main steps. Funding the Simbra version, discovering that it is in fact the network edition, and preparing a zip file that will contain the remote code execution payload. To find the Zimbra version, we will browse to a publicly accessible folder, which is what you can see now on the screen. This folder contains the files required for the web server to work. Using the grep tool, we will look for the vulnerable version string. The result shows several files that match the version. However, we can discard the ones that are not accessible by default. This leaves us with three JavaScript files. Let's use the grep tool again to see the context. File name suggests and the output confirms. This is the configuration file with different kinds of settings. What is important to us is that it correctly states the Simbra version we're currently using. We also need to confirm that the Simbra version is in fact the network edition, since the open source version is not moved to this path traversal attack. To verify this, we will use the grep tool once again to investigate the source code and try to find some clues. By looking at the results, we can infer that the login.jsp file is the target that most likely will help us because it can be browsed easily and without authentication. Notice the comment stating that the touch client exists only in the network edition. Now we can create the zip file with the path traversal string included in the contents file. We can use Python for this. As you can see on the screen, this script creates a zip file containing a JSP file. Here we cannot decode we want to the server to execute. In this example, it expects an argument that will be passed as a shell command. With this in place, we can see how a full exploit looks like. First, we have the necessary import for writing files, making requests, and writing arguments, and so on. Next, we use the arguments as variables and use the admin username unless otherwise specified. We obtain the server version using the method we described earlier. And we also check for the network edition. Now we can create the path traversal zip file using the code shown a few minutes ago and send the request using the chosen username. In this case, this will allow the upload the, the file, the JSP file and, and generate a file and store it in the web server. Lastly, we, went, we make a request to the uploaded file, sending our reverse shell that we can catch with a simple netcode listener or using your preferred method. Let's see this in action. We begin by starting the netcode listener. 
and then executing the exploit. A success message is displayed, and we can go back to the Netcat listener to confirm that we can execute commands. And there it is. This completes my demos. So back to you, Dan. Cool. Thanks a lot. So the this vulnerability was a bit unique in that it requires a valid username that we saw in there earlier. Um, but don't, you don't actually have to log in with the username. Is that right? Uh, it, it is, in fact, an unauthenticated vulnerability. That is correct. A valid username is necessary for the server to validate uh, um, the request. But you actually don't log in and, and, or need a password to do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, how does one go about finding a valid username um, if you, you know, aren't authenticated to the application? Uh, well, there are several things that you can do to find valid users from uh, simple um, web searches to, uh, you know, entering the website of the vendor and trying to find a, a contact page and see if there's a valid username in there. There are also, there are also several tools that, um, for the OSINT that are valid to um, retrieve valid usernames and try to search for them. Yeah, you might have already know some information too, like if you're, you know, attacking bank.com, then maybe just try, you know, like bank admin or bank or something like that, right? Correct. Yeah. There's cool. also so, um, yeah, yeah, uh, social networks that you can use or um, um, using tools like Spiderfoot, which which is a, a nosing tool for retrieving this kind of information. Yeah, but the admin is likely to be there because that's default. Right. Cool. Yeah. So, um, why this vulnerability? Uh, how did you come across this and uh, choose to make an exploit for it? Well, this is a vulnerability that caught my attention uh, last year, and I did in fact. Um, knew some companies that had this Simbra version installed and or that use a, a Simbra, uh, Simbra web server collaboration suit. So uh, with that in mind, I thought that it would be an exploit with a lot of impact and that it would be present in a lot of um, companies in the world. So that's why I chose to do a bit of research on that one. Great. That sounds cool. Uh, cool. We're going to take a couple of questions from uh, chat then. Uh, can you share any notable challenges you ran into uh, when you're working on this? Like anything uh, jumping your way? Well, finding out the network edition may be the biggest challenge. The method of using the script can be easily concealed. Uh, it just looks for a string on the on this on the files, and you know, editing that will effectively um, make the exploit return a false positive, a positive or uh, forces to go back to trial and error with launching an attack. So that right, yeah, work. but but at least uh, out of the box, uh, that the fingerprinting technique should work, right? Right. Cool. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, so when you're uh, approaching an application to exploit, um, like you know, what kind of uh, methods are you using um, to do that? Like what you know, uh, like what are you looking for in a server when you're trying to write an exploit like this? Um, well, usually what I aim to is to get remote code execution and a uh, simple reverse shell is what I usually aim to. Um, then you can escalate from that to a more robust solution, such as using Sliver or another command and control system. Mm -hmm. Do you know um, what was done in the remediation for uh, this vulnerability? Like what was actually done to uh, fix it um, by the developers? Yeah, Apache was... Um, was created by Simbra, and uh, several checks were performed to avoid uh, um, this kind of exploit from checking the user was authenticated and re also, also performing checks to remove the path traversal uh, mm -hmm. vulnerability on, uh, when extracting a file. Yeah, the uh, zip files are in general pretty hazardous, right? Like anytime you um, upload a zip file, this is something to watch out for, that the files could then be spread throughout the file system. So um, the it's definitely a tricky thing to watch out for and something to look for when you're uh, doing pen tests for sure. Um, the, but that is, so that doesn't necessarily lead you directly to uh, code execution, right? So perhaps um, you could elaborate a little bit more on like that jump. So you go from uh, saturating the file system with files of your choosing, right? The, the zip file lets you write an arbitrary file. 
But then how do you go from that to code execution? Right, as you mentioned, this doesn't necessarily allow code execution. You can just uh, saturate the server with, with file uploads uh, that can perform also denial of server or memory exhaustion. Um, to go to remote execution, we can, uh, what we did was to upload a, a JSP file, which the server will interpret. And what we did on, on the demo was to actually use a command inside, a system command or a bash command inside the uh, the web server in order to generate a reverse shell. Uh, but yeah, you can also upload a web shell directly, or you can just uh, okay. try to saturate the server with, with several uploads. And uh, is Zimbra itself a JSP application? There are parts of Zimbra that are uh, JSP and parts that are uh, PHP. So okay. um, in this case, the web server is running on JSP. So this is okay. the part that we took advantage of. Yeah, yeah. In case they had um, marked uh, some of the server as uh, um, uh, as non-writable, then you have some options there in terms of where to write and what to write. I guess. Right. Cool. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Um, <clears throat> uh, so why is the uh, uh, it's so important to do the version enumeration? Um, ahead of this, since that you know was an important step. Right, there are some versions that are not vulnerable to this uh, a kind of attack, or that they are already been patched. So you can looking for the correct version is um, something fundamental for the exploit to work. In the end, also it doesn't guarantee that the exploit will work. Some maybe the version is still a vulnerable one, but it was manually patched. So there's there's still this um, um, possibility. All right. Well, that sounds good for me. Uh, any uh, closing thoughts before we sign off? Uh, well, I'd like to thank you for the talking time and to watch this discussion to the audience. And um, I hope this breakdown of the similar vulnerabilities was uh, interesting. Uh, this set of vulnerabilities highlight the importance of um, addressing potential security risk on, on software systems. And yeah, I hope the discussion has uh, has been interesting for you and, and shed some light on the nature of exploiting this kind of vulnerabilities. All right, thanks a lot. Yeah, this was uh, What the Vuln. I'm uh, Dan, this is Carlos. Uh, if you wanna check out some more vulnerability uh, details, uh, look at our blog, uh, bishopfox.com slash blog, and we'll see you there. Thanks a lot. Thanks everyone.